Hey everyone, Nathan here, Absurd Being. All right, Phenomenology of Perception, video 10. So we're still in part one, talking about the body, but this chapter is the body as a sexed being. And the idea here is that we are turning to look at the affective milieu. So the more emotional feelings, um, the more emotional feelings aspect of, of our existence. So we're getting at, at this um, this aspect of our relation between of the relation between the subject and the world, because an understanding of this will help show us how objects exist for us in general. Um, and so this this dimension of human existence has often been ignored in philosophy, or treated as as a not an original mode of consciousness. So something that, that's kind of tack, tacked on, something that we ought to eliminate or, or um, suppress, you know, that, that, that we want to, philosophy is often um, being criticized as being too rational, focusing on um, more intellectual side of human existence rather than, than embracing these other affective dimensions that make up our um, our lives and that's this is important for Merleau Ponty because this also is something that that is at that phenomen that level of the phenomenal field so that our affects our emotions and our feelings don't just they're not something we can just get rid of and continue um, to investigate what's left and think we're getting a full picture we have to bring them into the into the story because they fundamentally determine the way things appear for us, the way objects appear for us in the first place. Again, it, these um, the affective dimension of our of our character of our of our existence um, not determines or conditions the way that things appear for us. So, if we want to understand perception, human perception, we have to include. Um, the effects because they 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 are a crucial part in that process. Um, so they've usually been ignored, um, and either and then our actions have been reduced to either avoiding pain or seeking pleasure, which is the empiricist account, or our actions have been thought of as being driven by um, a kind of directing objective will abstract will in the background choosing from its options that are laid out before it kind of in a, in a neutral sense and then um, deciding where it's going from there or what it's going to do and and that's the idealist or <clears throat> intellectualist account obviously Malo Ponti wants to get find a middle path between those two so we'll start this uh, this investigation through Schneider, our favorite um, guinea pig, and he has um, condition, it's his, his condition of sexual incapacity. So poor old Schneider, he's uh, just, he's got everything, he's getting hit with, hit with stuff from, from all directions it seems. Um, the issue here that we're going to focus on very briefly actually is is that he doesn't um, actively or volitionally or f through his own volition seek um, sex so there's no nothing it's just the act the sexual act has just lost any kind of motivating force for him <clears throat> And basically, the idea that we that we arrive at is that it's the same um, same idea as the one we discussed a couple of videos ago, and, and it, it concerns the way that Schneider understands the world, the way that he projects possibilities around him, or the way that he 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 can't do that anymore. He doesn't project these possibilities, and in this case. It's possibilities concerning sex. The everything is 
where nothing has a sexual dimension for him anymore. So the um, he's just lost that ability to project a, situa a, a sexual situation, a situation with any kind of sexual content. Um, and and this, in, in order to, to make sense of this and account for this situation in, um, in Schneider, again, Merleau-Ponty says we have to look at a, at a living zone in between the automatic reflex account of empiricism and the, the representation account of idealism. Um, <clears throat> and um, neither of those will account for it because the one treats us as, as a machine acting on sensory input, you know, stimuli affect us and then we, we react um, or we're, we're disassociated from everything and, and acting purely on, on our um, intellectual will as a result of our intellectual will. And neither of these can, can fully account for this. So we've got this, this living zone in, in the middle in which possibilities are projected by the subject. And, and, and now with that framework in place, we can see that <clears throat> um, Schneider's situation here, his, his condition, his, his position is that um, he the the possibilities that he projects around him, the background that he creates, just lacks this any kind of sexual sense. There's no sexuality associated with anything for him anymore. And so I'll read a quote for you. <clears throat> for there to be a normal desire for sex, there must be an eros or a libido that animates an original world, gives external stimuli a sexual value or signification and sketches out for each subject the use to which he will put his objective body. The patient has lost the power of projecting before himself a sexual world, of putting himself into an erotic situation. So that pretty much covers everything I was trying to explain, right? The, um, what I like about this is, is there's an element of... Um, lack of control it's not something and this is this is why that he Merleau-Ponty doesn't side with um, the, the intellectualist account because the the this eros or libido the way that Merleau-Ponty described it's almost like a, the an, you know the ancient Greek or Roman gods eros kind of um, creating the situation before us and, and we're just falling into it um, so that there's that element which takes us away from that idea that we're we are constituting consciousness as creating value out of nothing as it were but there's the other side too we're not just leaves caught in the wind drifting you know at, at the mercy of causal forces um, there's, there's there's a middle ground here and so to have for this this um, sexuality to be a part of, of our existence, we have to see the world in a sexual light, it has to appear to us erotic in some sense. And that's that's why Merleau-Ponty says sexual life is an original intentionality. There's that word again, reminding us of, of the intentional arc and the way that we project our intentions onto the world. <clears throat> and it's that which which gives things significance um, be, as soon as we're aware of them, as soon as we perceive them, they appear for us with this sexual sense, the sexual signification. Um, and for Schneider, the problem is that the world is, and in a broader sense too, I think, not just concerning sexuality, but the world is affectively neutral he just doesn't have this this dimension anymore it's not it's not part of of how he views the world and, and it's that which which lets us understand how he behaves towards the world okay so that that's a little bit about schneider now i want to look at freud 
and in his psychoanalysis. So Merleau-Ponty is, um, he goes kind of both ways with Freud. He doesn't go all the way in. Obviously, Freud is the, the big, the guy to go to when, when you're talking about um, sex and, and the way it, it uh, the influence or the, the, the motivation it has concerning human behavior. Um, and he says, so he says that, Merleau-Ponty, that is, says in disagreement with Freud that we can't e explain everything. We can't explain all human behavior through sexuality. So he disagrees with that. But he likes the idea, what what he sees as um, Freud's, the, un the, the underlying idea of Freud's psychoanalysis, that he's trying to reintegrate sexuality into into the human experience into the into human existence um, <clears throat> but perhaps he would say he's just gone too far he's, he's made it behavior and existence is kind of exclusively um, about sexual drives and, and motivation but the the important thing for Merleau-Ponty is that Freud contributes to phenomenology through this idea, through this, through promoting this idea that every human act has a sense, every human act comes with this signification on it, uh, or, or has has a is directed towards a world that is imbued with sense already. Um, so there's kind of positives and negatives concerning Freud from Malo Ponti's perspective. And I want to have a look at a second case study here where um, with what is called aphonia. So in this case, there's a woman uh, whose mother has forbidden her from seeing the man that she loves. And as a result of this, the woman is, is unable to sleep. She's lost her appetite and kind of strangely, she can no longer speak. She's lost the ability to speak. And that's, so that's the aphonia. Um, now, Freud, if we're considering aphonia, Freud would immediately blame this on the oral stage of sexual development. Um, the, the, the connections being obvious there. But for Merleau-Ponty, he says the mouth signifies more than just sex. There's more, more to it than this. There's a more general way we can understand um, what the mouth signifies for us. And it, it obviously also signifies speech or this um, communication in a more broader sense, the sense of coexisting with other people. And what she's in not speaking it or in being unable to speak, the signification of that, the sense behind it, is a refusal of coexistence. So she's um, the woman who who, who, can, who can no longer speak. That's a, that's a sign, um, and the signification is that that she's she's re refusing. She wants to to, to um, separate herself from. The situation that she's in, that she's stuck in, she wants you know she wants to disassociate herself from, particularly probably her mother, who's who's forbidding her from seeing this man that she loves. Same thing with the ability, or the loss of appetite. She can't swallow food, so Milo Bondi says there's a, another signification there. She's unable to swallow the situation, unable to handle, deal with, cope with. The situation and he says that there might still be some kind of sexual signification here <clears throat> um, and he allows for that and, and so that again there's value to Freud's analysis but the symptoms signify a more general relation to existence and we, we ought not to um, focus on on one aspect to the exclusion of all others 
So the, the, the kind of general point to take away from this is that the body constantly expresses or signifies the modalities of existence. So there's, um, <clears throat> the body has, has this, the things that we, we can see in the body, that in, in, the, in our actions and our behaviors, they reveal something about our connection with the world, about our relation to existence in this general sense. They signify our modalities of existence, how it is that we are um, existing. Unable to swallow food, she's unable to swallow the situation. She can't talk, she wants to, refusal of coexistence. So there's, there is this connection. But importantly, um, the sign in the body, the bodily sign, doesn't indicate a signification like a number indicates a house, like a house number indicates a house. So the sign is not a, it's not a signpost pointing towards something separate. <clears throat> so we can't say, um, and this is the temptation, right, to see, um, okay, she can't. She can't speak, so the, the, the signification, the meaning, the sense of that applies to something else. Not, it's not no longer, we're no longer talking about her body and her inability to speak, but that indicates something else, a, a perhaps um, constituting consciousness somewhere in the background that has some type of... Um, that is experiencing something in a way distanced from the sign. We can't separate the sign and the signification. The sign is the signification. The sign is what it signifies. So there's no, that, that's the, the one caveat that, that Milo Ponti makes here. Even though we do have a sign and it does signify something, the two are not separate. The sign is what it signifies. That's really important. I think I've said that before and I think I'll say it again in this very video too. Um, so he goes on to say that this woman who can no longer speak, who can't, has lost her appetite, she can't sleep, she's not putting on a show, she's not deliberately acting in this way. Um, so it's a genuine condition that she has. She's not, she's not pretending. Um, and it's not something we could, you know, she's lost her, lost her ability to speak. What, I mean, just talk, you know, it can't be that difficult. That, that's, that could be an initial um, approach to this or an initial way of seeing this, that it's, it's all in her mind, kind of. But Malopondi is saying, no, it's, she's not deliberately, she's not actively controlling this. She's not putting on a show. Um, and he has an, an interesting analogy she's lost her voice he says in the same way that one loses a memory and he gives this example of um, a man who's forgotten where a book is and the book was a, a gift given to him by his wife he's forgotten where it is and that him and his wife are having some kind of problems some dis dis some there's some um, there's some animosity there and as soon as that is resolved suddenly he remembers where the book is so he, he had forgotten and then he remembers after the problem is resolved and so th this is these are again I think um, actual instances of people with with these types of uh, these these are real cases I think not just things that Milo Bond is making up and, and what we have here is, is what he calls forgetting as an act. It's not something that, that happens um, by chance or, or, or randomly. The man, clearly, his forgetting was, was tied up, connected to his relationship with his wife, because it was a gift from her. When their relationship was rocky, he couldn't remember. He, he legitimately couldn't remember where it was. As soon as it was him and his wife worked things out, then he remembers where the book is. Um, and so he says this about this case. 
in hysteria and repression, we can be ignorant of something while knowing it, because our memories and our body, rather than being given to us through singular and determinate acts of consciousness, are enveloped by generality. Through this generality, we still have them, but just enough to hold them off at a distance from ourselves. So this is interesting, I think. Um, this idea that, and, and it accounts for something, you know, that this kind of ability that, that we have to deceive ourselves, to kind of ignore facts, some facts, while accepting other facts. I mean, and this is kind of, this isn't a particularly, um, well, this is a very common, I think, occurrence. And, uh, and you know, the same as with cognitive dissonance. We, we, we often experience that, but we're able to, to brush it off and, and kind of ignore the, 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 the thought or the, the idea that's giving us, that's creating the dissonance. We're able to brush it aside and just leave it and continue to have our, our views. We're kind of deceiving ourselves, but it's not, a, it's not a classic case of deception because deception always involves one, one party that knows the truth and one party that doesn't. And we don't have that here. We, we, there's only one party. It's us. Um, and so this, uh, this, uh, this way of understanding um, consciousness of Malopontes is quite nice because it, it does, it, it lets us see how this is possible, how it's possible that there's this kind of ambiguity built into human existence and the way that we think in consciousness. Um, we can know something without knowing it. Yeah, we can be ignorant of something while knowing it. Um, and this is because we're not like a computer. We don't, it's not just, if it's in, if it's there, if it's in the hard drive, we know it. And if it's not, we don't know it. There's a, there's a, a more general, ambiguous, impersonal level here. And that's what we're talking about, this impersonal, general, anonymous field. We've described this phenomenal field in these terms before, right? Or that the situation, that's the same thing, this background which we project around ourselves and it, it's it's here it's it's on this background it's in this field that certain ideas specific ideas actions and memories become either possible or impossible and so um in a way what we have is this idea of um so that what was i, I was going to say the man, before he can remember specific memories, he has to project a world around himself. There has to be this impersonal, anonymous kind of field that that he that he in, that he is in the middle of that he that he lives within, and that that field at the moment that he's fighting with his wife is a field in which anything associated with his wife kind of gets dulled or inhibited and so that the memory of specific things that have some kind of significance concerning his wife suddenly lose some of their importance they no longer appear in the same way that they would have or that, that they do when his relationship with his wife is good and um so he's he's he hasn't truly forgotten it. It's not that he doesn't know where the book is, but it's just that at at that time and with the the field that he has around himself, the way that he's perceiving things, and including memories, um, that particular memory is it, it doesn't register, doesn't stand out in any way. The field deadens or, or dampens that particular memory. Um, so I think that that's quite an interesting way of viewing things, and I, and I quite like it. Um, and it, the way that I thought about this originally when I first read it was 
we, you know, losing a memory, this, this man who lost his memory, he, he lost the memory not by focusing on the memory and, and kind of cutting it away, but by cutting the ground out on which the memory appears. So the memory is still there, it's still intact, but it's it's supporting background has kind of been cut out, and so and and that has the effect that the memory itself no longer appears before him. And of course, that that background can come back though, <clears throat> and when it does, the memory comes back as well. And so there's a there's a an interesting um, interplay here. It's it's not. Voluntary, the, the forgetting is not a voluntary act. The man's not deliberately forgetting, but he's not, it's not something that's that's random either. It's not just, it's not a random event. It's it's connected with his life and, and his current situation and his, 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 um, his experiences. So there's, it's not voluntary, but it's not involuntary either. It's, it's this, again, this kind of ambiguous gray area in the middle. And we can see the woman's aphonia in the same way. It's not voluntary. She's not deliberately putting on a show. She's not deliberately pretending not to speak. Um, but it's not involuntary either. It's not, it's not like it's just happened to her without, without any... any um, consideration for without any reflection on her current state of mind the experiences that she's going through so it's it's again in that in that gray area in the middle for the for the woman speaking is just now off the table it's not it's not even an option and that's because the the field within which she's seeing the world um, doesn't have that possibility speaking is is just it's something that that's that's it's not even an option it's not something that she can even contemplate it's just not part of her purview um okay so in order to cure this then <laughs> i feel like i'm I feel like i'm talking a lot in order to cure this then um we have to go beneath the authentic consciousness of the problem, but beneath an, an objective awareness of the problem. So Merleau-Ponty is also um, commenting here on, I think, psychoanalysis, which attempts to uncover and bring to light the original underlying reason, the, the cause of the problem. But that's not going to work because even if you're aware of, of why, um, the issue is it's not thetic. It's not. It's not. Um, it's not something uh, uh, related to a, a concrete, deliberate awareness of of of, um, of a situation. It's it's deeper than that. It, it concerns the field, well, and that's what you have to change: the field in which things appear for for the individual. So we have to get beneath this this awareness in order to effect a cure <clears throat> and and we'll say a little bit more about that in a moment as well uh, and there's another example that I really wanted to talk about which is sleep and, and Milo Ponti talks about this he says um, in the same way that the woman's aphonia was was involuntary and the man's forgetting was involuntary no one no one forces themselves to sleep no one puts themselves to sleep. Um, instead, what we do is call forth the visitation of sleep by imitating, Im imitating the breathing and posture of the sleeper. The God is there when the faithful no longer distinguish themselves from the role they are playing, when their body and their consciousness cease to be opposed to their particular opacity and are entirely dissolved into the myth. Nice again, and this is also reminiscent of Heidegger's talking when he talks about gods um, and 
I really like this idea actually the that you know you don't we're not in control of sleep we don't put ourselves to sleep all we do is is kind of curl up we, we slow our breathing close our eyes maybe quiet in our thoughts <clears throat> and then wait that's all we can do we just wait and and if we're lucky then sleep takes us and if we're not lucky it doesn't we lie there and toss and turn for however nice who knows how long um so it's it's kind of it's a nice way to emphasize that again we're not this directing active consciousness controlling stuff there, there's this element of um there's this gray area this anonymous impersonal general generality that surrounds us um yeah so that that's a really nice a nice little idea there okay let's turn from that and have a look at the body's role so the the role that the body plays here in this affective milieu and specifically concerning se concerning sexuality but more in general as well um, the body symbolizes existence as we saw with the aphonia and inability to, to swallow. Um, and it, so it symbolizes existence. It's a, it's, a, it's a sign because it actualizes existence. It is its actuality. It is the actuality of existence. So it's what takes um, existence and, and makes it concrete, makes it real. I really like that description. And it, again, it just shows the, the importance that Malaiponte is placing on the body. It's, it's what makes existence real. Um, so it opens up situations, as we saw, through that, that phenomenal field, that impersonal, anonymous field. But it also closes them, as we also saw. And the woman, he says, with the aphonia, will rediscover her voice, not through an act of will. It won't be her deliberate overcoming something. Rather, it'll take place through a conversion that gathers her entire body together. And that's a nice way to put that, and, and a nice way, I think, to think about what um, psychology is, is all about. It's not about you know, controlling the mind and, and using your mind to to actualize your outcomes or whatever, any any of that stuff. It's it's a it's a it's a it's a deeper level. It's beneath that intellectual um, volitional level of mind. So there'll be some kind of conver that's a that's another word conversion that that connotates a lack of control. You know, so it's going to happen. When it happens, we can, again, like sleep, we can perhaps create the situations that maybe this is what psychologist is or should be doing, creating a situation in which this conversion can take place. But it's not going to be an act of will on the patient, on the part of the patient. It's going to be something that happens in which their entire body will, will, will come into this and, and affect the change. Um, so the, the body can open up to situations, but it can also close situations off. But it, in doing that, it can't completely cut itself off from all situations. And if it, were, if it were able to do that, it would then become a thing. It would become part of the in itself. Rather, there's always some type of intention present. You know, we can't completely strip um, ourselves of all intentionality or would become objects and uh, the last point on this I have is that the body expresses our pact with the world another nice example another nice expression um, it expresses existence by being a signification in which the expressed and the expression are the same something I've already talked about quite a bit, I think, but again, just a very inclusive um, understanding of, of what the body is doing in our 
in our experiences. All right, so now I'd like to look, to turn, turn back to sexuality, the main topic here. And we'll focus, Molo Ponte first focuses on um, modesty, desire, and love, three dimensions, perhaps, of, of sexuality. And he says that these only make sense if we, um, if we don't see the human as, as a machine, as a mechanical um, response to stimuli, or as a directing, controlling will, a consciousness that, that's, that, that has complete control over, over its, its behaviours. <clears throat> Rather, we have to adopt this. Um, it is, it's, an, it's kind of an Hegelian account of our relations with others, but understood through the body. And um, so that Hegelian um, framework of how we interact with the other basically involves one person, there's a conflict, and so and one person um, becomes dominant. One person becomes the master and the other becomes the slave. Or in, in Sartre's, in, in Milo Ponte's terminology, one becomes the subject and the other becomes the object. And so in this, in this case, we have modesty, which is a, a shame of our body before the other. So we've been reduced to an object. The other's viewing us with, with their gaze and, and um, <clears throat> we're just an object for them and, and that provokes shame in us. And that, that's what modesty is. And that, that, that's what it, the only way it makes sense. So you, again, you can't explain that through a, a purely um, mechanical description or a, or a purely intellectualist account. Same with desire. Desire is a desire to possess the other's body, to reduce the other to an object and to, to take control of it. Love is um, an attempt to fascinate the other. So using one's body, <clears throat> I think that the way this works is you become an object for the other, but you, you attempt to fascinate the other. So the other's the subject, but you attempt to, to, to be that around which they revolve. So they're still the subject, you're still the object, but you are fascinating for them. That, that's a nice term. Sartre uses it too. Fascinating. You become a fascinating object. Um, and so we have to, we have to adopt this more encompassing, more um, nuanced approach, I think, is, 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 is probably a nice way to, to put it, between empiricism and intellectualism. <clears throat> and the point that Malo Pondi is making here is that behavior is not reducible to sexuality because the latter already contains it. It's already... Um, it's... It, Everything that we do is already imbued with the sense, the sexual sense. So there's no, there's no way to, that, that's the critique of Freud. We can't reduce behavior to, to sexuality, to, to impute kind of sexual um, meaning behind every behavior um, because it's, it's, it's already there. It's that feel the, the sexual sexuality is the field in which our behavior takes place. It's already spread around us in, you know, it's the, it's the lens through which we see the world and through which we decide how we're going to act. So all of our behaviors take place on this sexual landscape in a way. Um, and, and this brings us to, to really what I think is the main point regarding sexuality. Sexuality is neither transcended in human life nor represented at its core through unconscious representations. It is constantly present in human life as an atmosphere. And that's, that's the idea that I was talking about. It's, it's, 
sexuality is is the it's the atmosphere through which we move through which we live it, it fills everything it, and so it's there before we even before we even perceive you know as soon as we perceive something that sexual dimension is there um and so we can't transcend it we can't we can't escape it and then kind of look on it as if or, or act independently of it because all of our actions flow from from this this field which is is imbued with already imbued with sexuality um and and in this in the same way um it's not it's not it, it doesn't make up our behaviors don't reflect this core of kind of pure sexuality everything doesn't reduce back to sexuality for the same reason because our behaviors all take place within this sexual field um, and this is the same idea that we saw with the body schema i don't move my arm you know when my awareness of my body when i move my hand to grasp something i'm not i'm not deliberately or, or Aesthetically, it's a good word, focusing on moving my hand. My intention goes beyond my hand to the thing I'm going to, I'm trying to grab. Same here. We don't focus. Um, we're not, we're not aware of, of our sexual motivations. Um, because it, it's not, sexuality is not an, an, an object before us the same way that our body is not an object before us it's it's that through which we move it's that through which we experience um, and he says it, it motivates our experience without being an explicit object of thought really nice nice way to put this and just on the um, the front that it's the idea that it's ambiguous I've got another quote Thus understood as an ambiguous atmosphere, sexuality is coextensive with life. In other words, ambiguity is essential to human existence, and everything that we live or think always has several senses. There is osmosis between sexuality and existence. That is, if existence diffuses throughout sexuality, sexuality reciprocally diffuses through existence such that it is impossible to identify the contribution of sexual motivation and the contribution of other motivations for a given decision or action. And it is impossible to characterize a decision or an action as sexual or as non-sexual. So that, that's quite a long quote, but I think there's that, that's got everything in it. Um, Sexuality is this ambiguous atmosphere, this field through which we, we live and act. It's coextensive with life. Um, <clears throat> and it means that, and this is important, and we'll come back to this at the very end, it's, there's a fundamental uncertainty about human life um, that's not a consequence of um, some failure on our part to understand or some failure to have have considered something it's 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 built into to what we are as human beings something that can't be overcome um, it reminds me of that if you if you know anything about physics the heisenberg which i don't but but i know a little bit if you know the heisenberg uncertainty principle which says that you can never know the both the position and the momentum of a particle at the same time and to the extent that you know the position with uh, with more certainty, then then you know the momentum with less certainty. Um, so you never you can never catch both at the same time. And it's kind of the same idea here, that the, and the idea with that is that there's um, there's this fundamental uncertainty built into the fabric of the universe. It's not that if we just make better measuring instruments we will eventually get there and know both at the same time um, Heisenberg said that it's it's a fundamental uncertainty we, we can never know one uh, both at the same time 
more the, the more accurately we know one, the less accurately we know the other. And it's the same idea here. There's this fundamental uncertainty. It's not a result of, um, you know, if, if we just have better philosophy or if we think about things more clearly, we can, we can get there. If we, if we change the way we think, none of that's going to work. This is, this is a fundamental uncertainty, which is, is it's just part of what it means to be human. Um, what else am I saying here? The structure of existence, yes, the structure of our of human existence is is that by which something without sense takes on sense. So that that's what we're doing. That's 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 um, what the human. That's what human existence is. That's what our. It's not really our goal, but that is what we do as humans. Um, we we take something that has no inherent sense and we give it a sense, or it it, it becomes meaningful. Um, or in the same way, it's that by which something which only had a sexual sense takes on a more general signification, takes on a more general meaning. So the, this is the the nature of human existence. It's it's what it's what we're about as human beings. Um, I think that's everything I want to say. Ah, and that's the other thing. So we can never identify clearly what's what is what is the result of sexual motivation and what is the result of, of other motivations. We'll never be able to, to clarify that. And that's again back to Freud reducing everything to sexual motivations. Merleau Ponty is saying we can never do that and we can never even know how much is, is about sexual motivation. There is sexual motivation there, but we just can't say, yes, this is 100% sexual motivation, this is 50% motivation, sexual motivation, and also 50% from this other incident when you were young, blah, blah, blah. You know, we're not that type of... of um, of thing, we're not that type of, of being where you can break it down and it's everything's kind of black and white and clear. It's there's, there's gray everywhere. It's all gray. There's nothing else. It's just gray. Um, and so we can't characterize any decision or action as sexual or non-sexual. It's both, or it's neither. It, actually, it's both. I think that's the best best way to think about it. Um, Okay, cool. So that was that quote. And a little bit on a bit more broader note, the way that we give sense, this giving of sense to things, um, is Malo Ponti describes as a transforming of a de facto situation. So a <clears throat> de facto meaning like just a situation existing in fact, something that has no explicit meaning associated with it. So we take up this de facto situation, and in taking it up, we give it meaning, or it, it, it acquires meaning. And this Merleau Ponty calls transcendence. So when we transcend something, we we don't really, I guess we transcend the situation, we transcend the de facto nature of the situation, and give it meaning. And suddenly it acquires meaning in this phenomenal field in this background, impersonal um, situation that we project. So just following this, this thread of transcendence a little bit further, um, existence as transcendence, that is, again, that's what existence is. It's this taking up of these de facto situations, <clears throat> never leaves what it transcends behind. So we never completely get rid of, we never eliminate the um, completely contingent um, de facto, de facto nature of the, of the situation. Um, because if it did that, there would be no tension anymore. And that, that's, again, what lies at the, the core of human existence is this, 
this um, um, this interplay, this tension between um, which which is what the phenomenal field is. It's this. It's this. It uses takes up that that material that that de facto situation and gives it meaning. And if we didn't have that, if if, if if that de facto situation could ever be eliminated completely, we'd lose that ability because that's what transcendence is. It's the taking up of that situation. Um, so there, there, there can can be no fortuitous attributes, which is a word which just means contingency. There can be no accidental characteristics. Or another word, another expression meaning the same thing, pure facts in themselves. And that's because all content contributes to giving us our form. So all content is is, is crucial to, um, to, to, to the field that we end up projecting around ourselves. So we can never get rid of or eliminate or disregard that original de facto situation. I'm leaning on that word quite heavily, aren't I? Um, so none of this can happen. Um, we can't leave it behind. We can't transcend. We, we transcend the situation, but we can't, we can't. In transcending it, we don't get rid of it. We don't eliminate it. I think that's, that's what I'm trying to say. And that's because transcendence or existence is that movement. It is that transcending movement. That movement by which facts are taken up in the first place. So we can't get rid of the facts which underlie that movement, or there is no nothing for the movement to work with, nothing for transcendence to transcend, right? Um, and so th this is very. It has it reminds us quite a bit of of Sartre here, the way that we're talking about this, we're giving meaning to a situation that that has no meaning on its own, um, but but we're still resisting the, the direction that Sartre took it into this kind of completely, absolutely free constituting consciousness. And the, the way I thought about this actually when I was re reading through these notes is um, they both acknowledge, Sartre kind of acknowledges the, the facticity in human existence but he emphasizes the freedom that we have over over it all. And Meloponte is, is a bit more balanced. It's not neither one has has a has dominance. They're both both equally important. Um, and Sartre would say they're both equally important as well. But again, Sartre does um, yeah, he would say you can't have factors uh, for itself without without the in itself. There is no such thing. But, but still, once the for itself is there, it just acquires a real um, a freedom, an absolute freedom that, I, that it doesn't for Meloponte. There's more, it, it's more of a, a balanced approach. Um, and so the, the, what we're driving at, what I'm driving at here, is that there are no contingent facts or necessary ones in human existence. In fact, Rather, everything is necessary and everything is contingent. Which sounds like contradiction, but again, that's just, that's what it means when, you know, if that's a contradiction, then, then consciousness is a contradiction. Human existence is a contradiction. You can't explain that either. Um, and so it, it reflects the nature of, of what consciousness is, of what, and again, I want to avoid using that, overusing that word or using that word too much because it, it, it conjures up images of a detached intellect, a rational intellect. And that, that's not what we're about. It's more about human existence. But everything in human existence is necessary and contingent. Um, you, can't, you can't eliminate either of these. From the from the picture, so he gives a couple of examples here. He says, "Can't we imagine a human 
without feet or hands or sexual organs. You know, we can imagine um, a human that didn't reproduce through sexual organs, but, but reproduced in a different way. Um, and there, therefore, can't we say that the body is contingent? You know, it didn't have to be the way that it is. It, it, it just is the way it is. It's, con it's a contingent fact. And his response to that is to say that that is, is treating the body abstractly. It's treating the body as an abstract thing, which we can, and it's treating our body parts as abstract things, which we can chop and change to match and still be left with the same thing. Rather, we have to think about the body in its living function, what it does as a totality, as a whole. We can't, we can't, we can't look at our, <clears throat> the body's not a thing we can, and, and, and body parts aren't things we can just separate and, and pull apart and, and reshape and reform um, without affecting what, what, is it, what is at the core of human existence. And, and the other side too, opposable thumbs, he says. It's no, I, opposable thumbs and also standing upright, walking upright. It's no coincidence that we, that we have these traits. So can't we say that these are then necessary? They're necessary for um, a rational creature to have opposable thumbs or to, to walk upright. Um, and they're, they're necessary, but we don't get them by virtue of, of some essence that we acquire at birth. There's nothing, there's nothing inherently necessary about opposable thumbs or, or, or standing upright. So, and he says we have to continuously renew them, renew these features. And that, I think he means by, by using them, by living them. That's how we continually... Um, they're not they're nothing on their own the fact that we stand upright is nothing in in and of itself if you abstract that out from an actual human life opposable thumbs mean nothing in and of themselves unless we use them unless they're they're part of of a of a of a, a human life so I've written here, bottom line, the bottom line with this is that we aren't things made up of parts. We must think of the human being as a totality. <clears throat> we can't abstract, we can't think of ourselves in these abstract um, terms and, and hope to to come to, to any kind of clarity about about what we are, if that's, if that's the way we're going to go. Um, so my last point on this is that human existence, and this is a quote, human existence is the change of contingency into necessity through the act of taking up. I quite like that. And I think it, it um, again, this, as many times, the, the quote captures what I've been trying to express through minutes and minutes of, of um, rambling. Human existence is the change of contingency into necessity through the act of taking up. And in that act, that transcending act, <clears throat> neither necessity nor contingency um, dominate. Both, are, both have to be retained in order, or both are retained in human existence, in, in, in a human lived life. Okay. Now the very final thing that that Malo talks Malo Ponti talks about in this chapter is he has a little section about regarding dialectical materialism, which we'll look at right now. So the idea here, um, so this is obviously a response to Marx, Marx's idea that <clears throat> um, Political and, and historical events are driven or motivated or, or the result of um, real world considerations, things like um, you know, classes, labor, um, economics, obviously, wealth. These things drive 
um, events, historical events and political and shape political events. So that, that's the idea here. And, and the dialectical aspect is that there's this conflict between two, two opposing groups. They, um, they mix it up and then you get this um, resolution or synthesis of the two, which is hopefully better than, than the original position. So that's dialectical materialism. Um, and Merleau-Ponty treats this in the same way that we saw, that we discussed with sexuality. Sexuality was, wasn't, it didn't drive our behavior. It didn't, it's not our sole motivation. In fact, no act is sexual, but no act is non-sexual either. Every act is, takes place in the sexual atmosphere. Um, and it's the same here. Every act takes place on an economic and social background. And we each take up this, this background in our own manner. We each transcend this in our own ways. Um, and the, this, this, the drama that unfolds then is, is history. That's what history is. So in the taking up of this <clears throat> objective background, and, and the, the making of it, or the making it subjective, turning it into to something subjective, um, we can't say where the forces of history end and where our own contribution begins. Again, remember the same thing with sexuality. We can't say what's, what's a result of sexuality and what's a result of um, other, what's a result of another motivation same idea here we, we we can't we can't piece these together in a nice clear cut black and white fashion it's all kind of thrown in um, and he says even there's no point in even asking where the forces of history end and where ours begin the question's meaningless because history only exists for a subject and a subject must be in order to be a subject must be historically situated so there's a there's a circle there that again we not again I say that too often eh there's a circle there that we can't get out of and that that makes up human existence so it's not a vicious circle in the sense that we we need to escape it but it's a circle in the sense that um, it renders that question meaningless there's no way to 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 discuss it. <clears throat> Where does history end and where does where does where do, where do the forces of history end and where do our our own personal forces begin? They're, they're inextricably bound up in the same thing. They are the same thing. So there's no point in asking it. Um, and again, the the parallels with I say it again, man, the parallels with um, sexuality continue when he says that history has no single signification. Human behavior has no single drive, um, as per Freud. What we do always has several senses. Um, and this is the existential conception of history. So every historical, societal, and political phenomenon has an economic signification, but that's one signification among others. So there's always more at play. And ultimately, history can't be reduced to economics. That's the Marxist idea. But it never transcends economics either. It's always, it's always part of it. Um, and that, like I said, is, is pretty much exactly what we said about sexuality applied to um, economic forces. All right. Let's have a look at a summary. So first we started with so the, the, the main topic, obviously, was sexuality. We looked at Freud at the, at the beginning, um, and there was a critique of Freud in that Freud, the Freudian analysis that derives everything from sexuality, but it was, uh, there was value there too because Freud acknowledged that every act has a sense, um, and we can, we, can, we can use that intuition to, to then broaden the Freudian project. 
So sexuality is an original intentionality. It's constantly present. And it's like an atmosphere through which we, through which all our behaviors take place. It's also ambiguous. So no action is sexual or non-sexual. We just can't say. Every action is sexual and every action is non-sexual. Um, the other, another important part of this video was the body. And this is a part of just about every summary I think I'm doing for these, this chapter. No, no, um, no surprise there. It's about the body. Um, but the body here symbolizes existence because it is existence. And I liked that expression. It, it actualizes existence. It's like it, the body makes existence exist. It makes it real. Um, and so uh, there's that, also there's the that connection, the sign and the signification. The body is the sign, but it's a sign that is what it signifies. There's no distinction. We're not, we're not, the sign, the body is not a sign of something else, which is what, say, a consciousness or something, some, a real, what's really happening. What's really happening is the body. And the sign that we that we see in the body is what it signifies. There's nothing else here. Um, and the, the last thing, the last section I'd like to to close on here, I just I've just titled Human Life. It's kind of a general, a few general points. The first one is that possibilities always appear within a situation. Um, and we saw this with that example of forgetting, forgetting as an act, as um, something that it's it's volitional, but it's it's not purely volitional. It's not it's voluntary and it's and it's involuntary at the same time. But it, the idea is that those specifics, specific memories, specific acts, they take place on this more general background. And it's that which lets, which which allows us to explain this um, this ambiguity and, and this capacity we have for self deception, which is which is a really interesting feature of, of humans. I think another point was that human life is fundamentally ambiguous. Every act has more than one sense. That that's an important point to take away. Um, it struck me as important at the time. Uh, and the last point was also important, transcendence. This idea that of this, a taking up, which transforms the objective, a de facto situation, into the subjective, into a situation full of meaning, imbued with meaning. And it's then, it's only there, at that point, that we, that we perceive. Um, and finally, that in connection with that, everything is contingent and everything is necessary. There's no, we can't break these apart. Um, and, and we never leave, leave behind one for the other. Uh, okay, so let me finish that one there. I think this is going to be quite a long video. Eh? <coughs> um, anyway, hopefully that makes some kind of sense. I am totally frazzled, so I'm going to get out of here now and uh, thanks for listening and I'll catch you on the next video which will be the last one for this this first part and then we'll move on into the next thing thanks anyway see ya